All right, well, we're going to continue back with Jude. Jude, it's been a, uh, I, I don't know, I've, I've enjoyed going through Jude. I don't know about you. Um, it's something that, quite frankly, I don't really remember hearing anybody really do much of. They kind of seem to avoid Jude. I've never understood why. But in going through it, it makes sense why most people would not want to go through Jude. So, All right, well, we, uh, last week we were in verse number 11. And uh, so we're going to go back a little bit. We're going to read. <coughs> we're going to read through verse number eleven again. Uh, woe unto them! We know who it's talking about. It's talking about people like in verse number ten. It says, "But these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally is brute beasts. In those things, uh, oops, yeah, in those things they corrupt themselves." Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. So we, we read about that last week. We discussed all three of those different things that last week. Good morning. And uh, so we're going to pick up here in verse number 12. All right. So verse number 12 says, These are spots in your feasts of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit twice dead, plucked up by the roots. That's a pretty intense, I would say. So let's look at that a little bit. If we look at the first thing it says, for these are spots in your feasts. Uh, Go to 2 Peter chapter 2. One of the things that it talks about in my my studying for this is it referred to that as an example of rocks in a river. What happens when you put rocks in a river? It slows it down. The more you put in there, it can change the flow, it changes the rate, it can slow it down, and if you put enough in there, it can shut it down. So that, that was the, an interesting way that I read about it. But in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse number 13, the Bible says, <clears throat> And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are, and blemishes... Sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. One of the things that the point of this is, is trying to say that these people are going to be within the church. Within the body of Christ. They are, what does it say there in uh, verse number 13? Spots they are and blemishes. When the Bible talks about a blemish, it's referencing sin usually when it comes to like garments or blemishes on your self. Blemishes, spots, sin, okay? In this reference, it's talking about them being among you, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. Notice it says, sporting themselves with their own deceivings. If you go back here to Jude, verse number 12, it says, uh, these are spots in your feasts of charity, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Feeding themselves without fear. In other words, they follow their own direction. Without any fear, without any worry about what the Bible says, they do their own thing. They go their own way. Proverbs chapter 1 talks about people like that. We just go over there real quick. Proverbs in chapter 1. Look here, verse number 22. How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity, and the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge? Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you, I will make known my words unto you. This is wisdom, or 
a call from God to turn to Him. And if we look here in Jude and Peter, it talks about those that are among you in the church, in the body, that are doing their own thing. They're not following wisdom. They're not following what the Bible would have them to do. They're doing their own thing. And notice how it says here in Jude, verse 12, it says, feeding themselves without fear. That means they have no conscience about it. No conviction. They don't care. They want to do things their own way. Now, is that a bad thing? I would say it is. They choose their own direction over what God would have them to do. Here in 2 Peter chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2, wrong verse again. I do that all the time, don't I? Give me just a quick second. Let me look at this. Find the right one. Yeah, I wrote down the wrong verse. Okay. Well, anyway, the verse I was trying to find is the, that I thought I had wrote down is the one in 2 Peter where it talks about how they they walk after their own lust and they despise government. And a lot of times they will use that verse. Um, like I said, I wrote down the wrong one, so and I'm, I can't, I'm not going to read through the whole thing to find it. <clears throat> when the Bible talks about despising government, it's not talking about the one in Washington or the one in Santa Fe or the one in Albuquerque. It's talking about the government as in the, the guidance of God. What? Verse 18. You think of Second Peter chapter two? Let me look at that. No, it's not the right one. For, for when they speak uh, great swelling words of vanity that allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. Verse ten. Ah, oh, thank you. I'm going to fix that in my book real quick. I wrote a two instead of a one. There we go. All better. All right, so 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 10. Uh, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. Presumptuous are they, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Now remember here a couple of verses back in Jude, it talked about those that speak evil of dignities, things that they know not. And if we look here in uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 10, not 20, I don't know where I got that one from, it says that, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness. Jude talked about them being spots in your feast, people who feed themselves without fear. They don't care what the Bible says, and that's the problem. They don't care what the preacher says. So it says, and despise government. Well, if we look at what the biblical government would be, it would be the book and godly preachers. That's the only government, as well as also, of course, your parents and all that, too. But if we look at that today, we see a lot of people that despise government. Now, what's sad is a lot of times they'll have used that verse in the, in the, in the history of, of society, really, to try and say that you can't be against the government, like, you know, the one in Washington, D.C., or the one in London, or whatever. That's not what it means. That's another example of changing a verse or twisting a verse to fit what you want it to fit. We, went, we, we dealt with that a lot when the, the COVID stuff was going on. They say, oh, well, you have to listen to the government. You can't tell the government, no, you can't go against what the government says. If that was the case, the United States wouldn't exist <laughs> because we wouldn't have told the king to uh, take a long walk off a short pier because that would have been despising government. And anyway, so that's, that's neither here nor there. All right, we go back to Jude. Go back to Jude, verse 12. Feeding themselves without fear, 
Clouds they are without water. Clouds without water. Second uh, Peter talks about that as well. It's interesting to see the parallels between different apostles and Jude. You look here at Second Peter chapter two verse seventeen. The Bible says, uh, "These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever." It is an example of the lost. Because what did Jesus tell the woman at the well? It's a good example when it comes to water. What water is this referencing? Is this referencing the stuff that, you know, falls from the sky, lands on the roof, and then, no. It's referencing Jesus' water of life. Okay? Without that, you're a cloud without water. Mm -hmm. It can be. Well, this too, he's also warning about the lost in the church. Because there are those that are lost in the church can drag it down. Because they are not spiritual. They're not part of the church. They're sitting in it. They're, they're part of it, but they're not going to be of it. And they can be a problem. Now, does that mean that we should run them out? No. Our goal should be to see them get saved. Kind of a, a picture of what he was talking about. Proverbs chapter 25. Proverbs chapter 25. Look at verse number 14. Bible says, Whoso boasteth himself of a false gift is like clouds and wind without rain. Clouds and wind without rain. Well, what are false gifts? Most of what the modern gospel is today is false gifts. Odd twists of salvation. Those are false gifts. Those are false teachings. Those are clouds without water. Wind without rain. It's, it's something with nothing. Yeah, exactly. Speaking in tongue, prophecy, the healing weirdos, you know, uh, that you never see go to a hospital for some reason. <laughs> when was the last time, uh, oh, oh, what's his face? Benny Hinn went to the hospital. Not because he was sick, but, you know, to go in there and swing his coat around and make everybody feel better. He's never done it. Never done it. <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. There was a... Uh, there was a thing done, I think it was by 60, 60 Minutes, or was it the other one, 2020? Remember, there was, the, there's, it was, the, anyway, and it was done way back in the day, maybe early 2000s, late 90s, I don't remember. And there, there were people that, that came forward, they actually had real problems, like cerebral palsy or a bum leg or things like that. And they would, uh, they would hand out little cards at these uh, healing crusades. And they would write down what's wrong with them. And then the handlers or the stage managers, whatever you want to call them, would pick and choose those that they wanted to actually go to Benny. So the person that went in there that was actually wheelchair bound and had you know cerebral palsy, they were shriveled up or whatever, they were never allowed to go to Benny Hinn. It was, you know, the little old lady that had some arthritis in her hip that, you know, could go up there with a walker and then, you know, walk away from the walker and look okay. Yeah, they did. So, uh, yeah, that is a, uh, what did Proverbs chapter 25 say? Verse 14. Whoso boasteth himself of a false gift is like clouds and wind without rain. They're useless. They're useless. When we look at the, the gifts in the Bible times, all the healing, all the uh, speaking in tongues that was actually recorded in Scripture, were all done for people to get saved or to go towards Christ. And if we also think about it too, what did Jesus say about those who seek after a sign? They were a wicked and perverse generation. He was talking about the Jews. The Jews were the ones that were really heavy on having to see a sign, having to see proof. 
And if we look at everything that happened, those gifts were for a specific time period. They don't happen now. They just don't. We look at the day of Pentecost when the actual tongue thing happened, and Peter was speaking in his native tongue. He was speaking in Hebrew. But everybody else, whether they were from Italy or Greece or Ethiopia, it didn't matter, they heard him in their own language. So what does the Bible say about those that claim they have those gifts today? They are what? Clouds and wind without rain. A lot of show, but nothing. We see that a lot today. We see that a lot. It's all about the emotions. It's all about what you can see. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> Let's go up a verse to verse number 12. This is after talking about, well, well, we'll start at 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. This was kind of like a listing off of the offices that have existed. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That is one of the easiest ways to judge somebody that claims to be something. These people right now today that claim to be apostles, what does their work do? It makes them rich. If you look at it, if you look them up, you can find them all over Facebook. They're uh, usually a guy that lives in some place in Africa, and he basically is the richest guy in the village because he's apostle whoever and whatever, and he uses that for personal gain. What does the Bible say that those offices existed or exist for? For the perfecting of the saints. How do you perfect the saints? By telling them to give money to you? No. By telling you, oh, you know, you can say this and pray whatever you want and God will give it to you just because you say it? No. You perfect the saints by teaching them this. By teaching them what this says. By encouraging them to live better. Exactly. How many of these modern day apostles, prophets, evangelists, like, uh, what, uh, what, what's, that, what's, that, what's that guy's name? Comes to mind. Um, T.D. Jakes. He claims to be an evangelist. <laughs> and some pastors and teachers. We look at all of the modern, any, you list any of those. And what do they do? They edify themselves. They glorify themselves. The original apostles, how much of themselves did they glorify? You can read about all of them, and not once did they glorify themselves. So I guess that would mean that all these ones today are fake, aren't they? They're not real. Prophets, we look at the Old Testament prophets and we look at the, some of the New Testament ones. For example, John the Baptist. Who did they edify? Who did they glorify? God. Who did they point towards? Jesus. Or God is in you know, the ancient Old Testament prophets. And to the coming of Jesus. But what did they do? Did they talk about themselves? 
John the Baptist, when Jesus, he, when he talked about Jesus, he said that he was unworthy to even unlatch his shoe. And when Jesus told him, asked him to baptize him, he said, uh, no, I can't do that. You're the son of God. I'm not worthy. And Jesus said, well, you better do it. You've got to do it. <laughs> yes, I'm paraphrasing, okay? This isn't the, the Jake translation. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing. But he did not speak of himself. He did not make himself wealthy either. He was known as a wild man. He, he was out in the wilderness clothed in hair and eating wild honey. Camel hair. Camel hair. He ate bugs. He was his own pest control. Well, that's why he wore the camel hair. It attracted, ew, anyway. Uh, it attracted more bugs. <laughs> <clears throat> But he didn't edify himself one way or the other. He pointed people to Jesus. So these modern ones, who are they glorifying? Themselves. If you're on TV with millions of dollars, you're really not going to be glorifying Jesus. I'm sorry. You're not going to be that popular. It's true. So we look at that, it says, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. What is the work of the ministry? Reaching people for Christ. That's it. That's it. Anyway, keep going. For the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the uni unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. That's what false teachers do. They lie in wait, not just to deceive the lost, but to try and deceive the Christians. And why would Satan, or why would the lost, or why would anybody want to deceive Christians? To stop them from doing what God wants them to do. And what does God want us to do? Reach anybody and everybody we can for Jesus. That's the whole point. So anyway, we see all these things. Salvation is the key of it all. All false teachers change salvation. That's the thing. Uh, Paul talks about what we'll get. We're, we're, one of the things Paul talks about is that there's different administrations, right? That means our church and the church down the road, we might do things a little differently, but the important part is salvation. And I think that's something that gets lost on us sometimes. It's easy to say, well, you're not, you don't go to my church, so uh, you're different than I am. The important thing, though, is how they focus on salvation. What is salvation? Jesus himself stressed it was belief and repentance. Go to Mark chapter 16. <clears throat> Mark chapter 16. Look at verse number 16. It says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now notice it doesn't say, He that believeth not and is not baptized. So it is the belief that matters. Go to Luke chapter 13. Just a few pages over from Mark. Luke chapter 13, verse number 1. The Bible says, There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all Galileans, because they suffered such things? I tell you, Nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Or those oat, uh, eighteen. That's not even a word. Or those eighteen upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them. 
think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Has nothing to do with works, has nothing to do with special lightning striking you in the head. It has to do with belief and repentance towards God. That's it. That is the kind of unity in the faith that Paul talks about. Do we do that? Sometimes we don't, do we? Sometimes we don't. I've met preachers that I don't agree with on a lot of things. But then they say that salvation is that way. Through faith and repentance. Not plus baptism, not plus speaking in tongues, not plus anything else. You know what? We might disagree on some things. But you know what? I'm not going to attack them. How many souls are they winning? That's the important thing. We need to do that more often. And we don't. And we don't. But Paul said we're supposed to have unity in the faith. Unity of the faith. And the knowledge of the Son of God. It's very important that we do that. So go back to Jude. Jude, verse number 12. Can you down, continue down a little bit? <clears throat> Jude, verse number 12. Trees whose fruit withereth. Trees whose fruit withereth. Go to John chapter 15. This is Jesus speaking, verse number one. It says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Now go over here to James chapter 3. Verse number 17. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. What are fruit? It's souls. What are good fruits? They're good things that we do. They're good works that we do. Everything we do should draw to Christ. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 9. Go over there. He that hath a bountiful eye shall be blessed, for he giveth of his bread to the what? To the poor. Hmm. Does that sound like a good thing to do? It does, doesn't it? Okay. Go over here to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Look at verse number 35. This is 
Paul, saying, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak, and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. How many of you have ever heard that one little statement? It's better to give than to receive. We've all heard that. Well, we used to hear that. They don't talk about that much anymore, do they? Well, that's interesting. Okay, so 1 John chapter 3. Go over there. First John chapter 3. The Apostle John, verse number 14. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. Amen. He that loveth not his brother abideth in what? Death. It means he ain't saved. Pretty simple. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. That's not good. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the what? Brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? Uh oh my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. I read those few different scriptures. We see an Old Testament version, we see, and we see two New Testament versions. What is the main theme of that? Help each other. How simple is that? Help each other. Showing fruit. So can uh, feeding the homeless be fruit? It can be. Why are you feeding them? Are you feeding them to show them that Jesus loves them? Or are you feeding them because it makes you feel good? There you go. See, that, that's something the Salvation Army used to do. They, they used to take care of the homeless. They used to feed them and everything and then present the gospel to them. Now, did everybody that go to eat soup at the soup kitchen get saved? No. But did they have the opportunity? They did. Is that the important thing? something about that. Mm -hmm. You know, some try and say that we shouldn't have programs to help others because our job is to only get them saved. No. How can they get saved if they don't know Jesus loves them? What's the point? Have you ever noticed that in, this, uh, in the abortion debate, they say that, well, you Christians only care about unborn babies. You don't care about them after they're born. You don't care if they starve. You don't care if they're homeless. You don't care if they're on drugs. How bad of a reputation is that? Should we care about that poor junkie that's on Central right now that's screaming at traffic lights? Yes! What can we do to help him? We can try and talk him into going to rehab. Should we try and do that? Yes. What about that poor schizophrenic that doesn't know the difference between reality and the hallucinations in their mind? They're not going to get this in that frame of mind. So what do we do? 
Do we call them demonic and tell them to go down the road? No. We try and convince them to get what? Help. What about the homeless? Sure, we can throw food at them all day long, but we got to witness to them while we're doing it. We got to tell them, hey, Jesus loves you when we're giving them that sandwich. What does the Bible say about doing good? That we're supposed to. That we're supposed to do good. Every time we help the lost, it is to do good and point them to Jesus. We're also to help the brethren. James chapter 2. Look at verse number 15. If a brother or sister, remember in the Bible, anytime it says brother or sister, it's talking about Christians, fellow Christians, okay? Be naked and destitute of daily food. They're in bad shape if they're that bad, aren't they? And one of you say unto them, one of who? One of us. Depart in peace. <laughs> it's, it's sad, but it's kind of funny the way he... Right? Uh, <clears throat> Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Nothing. James, uh, John said, if you shut up your bowels of compassion against your brother, you don't have God. You don't have God. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Can you be saved and have dead faith? Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. So, how many people have we known that are like James describes right there? How many of us have read that and chuckled to ourselves, thinking of somebody that we know that has been that way? If your brother or sister is destitute naked, has no food, and you look at them and say, be ye warmed and filled, what good does it do? It doesn't do any good, does it? Would that be a good work? Uh-oh. How many times have you seen somebody say they're having trouble, and then somebody comments on their post or says in person, I'm praying for you? And all of a sudden, people are looking at him and say, that doesn't do any good. Have you seen it on Facebook? When, you know, thoughts and prayers. Whenever somebody says, thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers. Oh, you're struggling with finding a new house, or your car's broken down, or, or you have no food, or you lost your job, or all this. And they say, I'm praying for you. And they just leave it at that, and they walk away from it. That is exactly what James says. Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. That's literally saying, I hope you do better. Well, but, but I've got supper to go do right now. Is that a good reputation to have? No, but that's the one that us Christians have. Think of uh, Joel Osteen when they had that uh, massive uh, hurricane hit Houston, and he refused to let people that were displaced from their home, struggling out in the weather, starving into his mega church stadium and help them. But I guarantee you, put out a tweet, say, oh, my prayers are with the victims of the hurricane. Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. It's going to be okay. Shouldn't we help one another? What about the loss? Shouldn't we help them to show them that Jesus loves them? Look at the things that Jesus did when he was out in the wilderness, and it talks about how he fed the 5,000. Were all of them saved? No. Why did he do that? It said that he had compassion on them, and he fed them, and he preached to them. Do we have compassion on the world around us? Uh-oh. 
Now, a lot of times they will use these verses that talk about giving. It is more blessed to give than to receive. God loveth the cheerful giver. We use those verses to help people see that it's okay to give money to God. But that's not the only thing we're supposed to give to. We're supposed to help each other. We're supposed to help those in need to show them who? Jesus. That's the entire point. But we don't. But we don't. I, I, we put a, a community resources page on our website. And uh, there's a way that people can submit to it on there and everything. Why did I put that on there? Why did we put that on there? To help people. That's what we're here to do. To help them. To show them that we love them like Jesus does. Well, we're not going to get through the rest of this. I went a little bit later than I should have. So we're going to pick up the rest of Jude verse 12 next week. And then... Um, Probably move into 13. So, all right, we'll take a break.